Hi, and welcome to this little experiment. So, this is an ASMR chess video, and if you are unfamiliar with that term, you might be a bit freaked out by the way that I'm speaking. Please do not be alarmed if you feel that this is a bit too odd for you. There are plenty of normal chess videos on YouTube. If, however, you are curious about the ASMR component in this video, I shall give a brief introduction to the concept before we dive into pure chess goodness. So, ASMR is an abbreviation for Autonomous Sensory Meridian Response. ASMR has been coined to describe a category of primarily undocumented sensory events occurring in an indeterminate subset of the population. A brief description of ASMR would be a pleasant, often intense, tingling sensation that begins in the head and travels down the body to varying extents. This feeling can be triggered in various ways, and in the later years, a very large and quite curious community has gathered on the internet in an effort to develop these so-called triggers. One known trigger is calm and intimate rambling, so I'm going to ramble about chess. Today we will look at one of my own games, and contrary to my calm nature, when I play chess, I play aggressively. I opened the game up with the Queen's Pawn, the so-called Queen's Pawn opening, which is a line that I have studied to some extent and have some surprises to throw my opponent off. So, I'm trying to stake a claim in the center with this move and grab control of the central squares, which is a strategic goal in all games of chess. Now my opponent, answers in kind, playing his queen's pawn, but only one square forward. In this way, he contests the squares that my pawn is attacking. I now bring another pawn to bear on the center, grabbing even more space. At this point, my opponent begins an interesting and very good maneuver called the fianchetto of his king's bishop. Now you can see this bishop here can move to this diagonal, and if you notice, this is the longest dark square diagonal on the chess board. Therefore, a dark squared bishop posted on this diagonal will be attacking the maximum number of squares that it can. Also, it will be protected by the pawns surrounding it and will aid the king if he should choose to castle on this side. I develop my knights so that it can help my pawns keep control of the center, while my opponent answers by putting his bishop on the dark squared diagonal as we discussed. I complete my claim on the center by playing the king's pawn. We then both develop our knights, my opponent castles his king to safety, and I play bishop to e2. I am now ready to castle, but as you will see in a moment, I won't. This position here is a so-called theoretical position. It has been studied by masters for many, many, many years. It has been played hundreds if not thousands of times before. And there's quite a lot of so-called theory about how you should play it, what the strategic goals are, and so on and so forth. One thing that White always does in these positions is to castle his king to safety. Now I'm not going to do that. Instead, after my opponent develops his last knight, I push my pawn to h4, neglecting my king's safety. This is a very aggressive move and the first move that is not considered theory. Because, to be very honest with you, it is a slightly dubious move. Now why is this dubious? Simply because it neglects the safety of my king, who is, after all, the most valuable piece on the chessboard. 
Why do I do it anyways? Because my opponent has to play very, very precisely from this moment on in order to counter the attack that this move enables me to build up. My plan is to use this pawn as a can opener to chip away at my opponent's king's position, to tear his castle down, if you will. If I succeed in this, my rook will be able to join the battle without ever having to move and I will therefore have saved a little bit of time. My opponent will not allow this. He can't. Therefore he starts by blocking my pawn in its tracks. Boom. Like that. I expected that. I have seen it quite a few times before. It is after all the best move in the position. Now I put my knight over here and I start a very crude plan of simply putting all my pieces near my opponent's king. My hope is that I can reach him and tear his castle down before he can exploit the weakness of my own majesty. By deviating from the trodden path in this way, I gain an advantage both psychological and also very practical over my opponent. So we played a very standard opening and suddenly I deviate. I do something unexpected and he can figure out that this has to be inferior in some way. But how? So he hasn't seen the move before, but I have. I have played this many times. So psychologically I have thrown him off. He has to think on his feet and practically I'm familiar with the position and he isn't. I must applaud my opponent for his reaction in this situation. What he does is very courageous and also quite sensible. He tries to punish my inferior play by going on an immediate counterattack. So he puts his knight here and his plan is to sacrifice it, to gain momentum, to attack my king. So I should be quite worried about this and I was during the game. So he puts his knight at this very nice outpost right here, which is of course quite intolerable. I must do something about this. So I try to kick him away to coerce him to move with this small pawn move. And it is at this exact moment that he shows his idea. He leaves the knight and captures my pawn. So now he's destroying my carefully constructed center control and he threatens to overrun my forces and tear down my castle before I can get to him. I mustn't allow this. I can't. So I answer fire with fire and capture his knight. I accept the sacrifice and we go from quiet strategic positioning and maneuvering into a wild street fight. He then chops off my bishop and I recapture with the knight in order to bring it from the queen side to the king side. The idea here is to bring it closer to my opponent's king in order to overwhelm him with my forces in a brutal whirlwind attack. So after I capture his bishop, he captures my pawn right here, and as a result of this sequence of moves, I have lost two pawns and a bishop, and my opponent has lost two knights. In chess terminology, we say that white has gained a material advantage since the collective power of the pieces that he has captured is in theory greater than the relative power of the pieces captured by the opponent. Now this is all theoretical of course and the outcome of the game will certainly be decided by how the individual players handle the specific position. Now you may notice that there exists a relationship between the black bishop, the white knight, and the white queen. The pieces are positioned in such a way that if 
the white knight should move, the black bishop can freely capture the white queen. Now we call this, in chess terminology, we call this configuration a pin. We say that the bishop pins the knight to the queen. This heavily restricts my options, so I hurry to get my queen out of the way. I do this with this move. Here my opponent tries to lock down the center with this little pawn move here, and I begin a small adventure with my knight. So you will see how this knight has journeyed from its starting position all the way to the king's side and will be instrumental in the final assault. At this point, my opponent coordinates an attack between his bishop and his queen. Those two always work well together, so they want to attack this weak point in my position. Now this may be a strategical mistake. You see, this point is quite removed from where the action is. The action, I claim, is on the king's side. That's where it happens. So I finally castle. I allow this pawn to fall. I capture his bishop and he captures mine. So we have given a bishop each and I have also given a pawn. Now I consider that a sacrifice, and I have sacrificed that to gain momentum by dragging his queen away from where she should be. She should be either attacking my king or defending her own husband. Now she does neither. I attack her with the rook, she moves and gobbles up, gobbles up in greedy fashion another pawn. So I go down here, I capture a pawn. Sure, but that's not what it's about. It's about getting the rook on this very critical line so that it points to my opponent's king and lines up beautifully with the other rook. Now the knights and the rooks are cooperating. My opponent doesn't want to tolerate this knight. He wants it gone. There are two reasons for this. One is it's too close to his king. The other one is that it guards a square that he considers quite instrumental in an idea that he wants to carry out. He wants to make a double attack with his bishop on my queen and my rook. I'm not too afraid of that actually because I have done some calculation. I thought that might be interesting for him, so I laid it out as bait. I start by moving my knight to d5, and as you can see, I'm ready to give a check. So now that the knight is no longer defending the square, my opponent jumps it and attacks my queen and my rook. He's quite happy with himself at this point, I guess. But I throw the check. Check to his majesty. All right, the king moves. Now I move my queen. I'll just move her like so to e3. Is this a threatening move? Well, you can see from my arrows that it is. But it looks kind of like I'm just getting out of his attack. That's what he thought. He captured my rook. And now it's all, all gone. So, I put my knight here. That was the whole plan, all the time. So, this is of course check. And... What can my opponent do? First of all, we must point out that the tactical device of the pin, the configuration we discussed earlier, exists in a different form in this position. The rook pins the pawn to the king so that it cannot capture the knight. Should he go to h8, 
like this. My queen will surely deliver checkmate like this. Notice how the knight and the queen cooperate to cut all the escape path away. So my opponent couldn't do that. What he did instead was to capture my knight. It is free. Of course it isn't free, but that was his hope. Now I land a check here. My other knight blocks his escape path. He can't get back into his castle. Now he's out of the castle. The hunt begins. So my rook cuts off so he can't go backwards. And my queen cuts off so he can't go forward. Forwards, so he has to capture my knight. And when he does, I land this devastating checkmate move. Checkmate. So I only have a queen and a rook of the heavy pieces left. But that is enough because they cooperate with the small man, the pawn, and the pawn blocks the escape route and it's over. So that was my game and I sincerely hope that you could take something away from it, be it relaxation or perhaps an interest in the beauty and intricacies of chess. You are more than welcome to leave suggestions or questions in the comments. Have a nice day, night, evening, morning or whatever it is where you are in your life.